Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which has been hosted by HDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Chloe McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb. And I'm pleased to bring you this morning's webinar on genetics of lamb survival. Our presenter this morning is Dr. Forbes Bryan, Associate Professor at the University of Adelaide. And we're also joined by Sam Boone, Animal Breeding Senior Manager at HDB. So the plan of action is that Sam will give a brief introduction and then we'll hand over to Forbes for the main presentation and there will be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if you'd like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screens. I will then ask Forbes your questions at the end of the presentation. If you can't see this box, you may need to press the orange arrow to open this box up. The webinar will be slightly longer than usual this morning, roughly 45 minutes, as it's also replacing the events which we had to cancel this week. So if you do need to disappear at any time, please do still type in any questions you might have. We will ask these at the end and you can listen back to the answers on YouTube. So hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties this morning. Forbes is joining us from Australia, but fingers crossed it all seems to be working okay. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Sam to kick us off. in Belfast a couple of years ago and really good to have the opportunity to invite him back back here in conjunction with B work over recent weeks in pulling together the papers and presentations of the conference and the farmer meetings that he was looking forward to but we will buy those in, in due course. Ah, there we go. Um, for those that uh, don't know me, I'm Sam Boone. I manage Signet Breeding Services and we deliver genetic evaluations to over 30 different um, sheep breeds uh, across the, the country. And all the information that these are slightly challenging times, particularly when coming to the location and selling a breeding stock. And it would just be useful for me to highlight a couple of the tools that have been developed through the new website in recent weeks. Um, first of all, we've developed a um, flock and herd finder so people can find flocks and herds based on postcodes that are close to them, the latest EBVs in those enterprises. Sorry, folks, not a seamless link, obviously, between the slides. Um, there's a sheep for sale and cattle for sale section, and we've had over 100 animals that have gone up on that in recent days, probably as a result to the changes in sales. And we've also got flogging facilities that have become available so clients can actually produce their own catalogues and send them out to their uh, customers. So there's a few new tools available. To bring us back to today's subject, I want us to think a little bit about breeding. Uh, more productive females and um, that are of interest to us from producing a ewe with good reproductive performance that's fitted to the farm resources with a long productive life and of course weaning a lamb that meets animal market requirements and to be fair this is the bit we've focused on in recent years or recent decades because it's easy to do it's the low hanging fruit within our breeding programs and what Forbes is going to do today is talk to us about the sort of next generation of traits that we need to think about. We have made a start in the UK uh, within our maternal breeding programs. We do have breeding values that are available for lamb survival, for reproductive performance and overall ewe longevity. So we do have some breeding values. Um, but um, I can see a note from Liz here about sound issues. So uh, sounds as if uh, the sooner we get to Forbes, the better. And in terms of terminal sires, um, we do have breeding values for lambing ease amongst the number of traits that we have. So to think about today, really two main questions from me. How can we increase the number of lambs per you without increasing lamb mortality? And how can we improve flock productivity 
through our selection of female replacement. Right. On that basis, Chloe and Liz, I think I'll hand over to Forbes. Hello, it's uh, Forbes Brian speaking. Uh, I might just start by describing uh, a little bit about myself, just so you are familiar with who's who's speaking. I was uh, raised on a uh, mixed farming property in Victoria. Uh, my my family uh, had been farming for quite a few generations, and we had sheep as well as uh, oilseed crops and perennial ryegrass seed for seed production. Uh, once, once I uh, did my schooling and university, I started work for the Victorian Department of Agriculture and worked initially in research and then as an, an advisor for the sheep industry. Uh, but I always had a yearning to do more study and, uh, and work in research. So in uh, roughly 30 years ago, I went to Edinburgh and did my doctorate there in, in Scotland. Uh, then came back to Australia uh, after a little while back in research. I took on a job fairly similar to to Sam's uh, in an in, in a very early performance recording scheme for the wool industry in Australia. Uh, from there, I uh, became involved with research management and uh, went back to Victoria for a number of years, and then came back to South Australia about uh, fifteen. 15 years ago, thereabouts, 16 years ago. And these days I'm a research fellow with the University of Adelaide. So basically I mainly uh, work on research and development and uh, just do a little bit of casual teaching every now and then. So today I'm going to talk about really the genetics of lamb survival, but in relation to that also talk about uh, you maternal in instinct and behaviours. Uh, and just by way of introduction, uh, that's that's me there. Um, uh, so basically, poor lamb survival is really a key cause of reproductive efficiency in flocks around the world. Uh, so you're not really alone in the UK. In fact, in Australia, we have much higher rates of lamb mortality. But if you look across the world, the average mortality rate or survival rate is about 85%. In other words, about 15% die. Uh, and that hasn't really changed much over the last 40 years from all the various studies that uh, Kathy Dwyer and colleagues uh, reviewed a number of years ago. So clearly uh, lamb mortality is really a growing welfare issue as, as being a significant economic loss to the industry and to sheep, sheep producers in general. Uh, just in Australia, uh, it's been estimated that lamb loss is uh, worth around just under half half a billion um, uh, Australian dollars per year, which is about eight percent of total farm gate value of the sheep industry. So, you know, with that, we'll then get into discussing genetic improvement of lamb survival and maternal performance. So, this is. Uh, just a table of the work that Kathy Dwyer and colleagues did in a review about four years ago, uh, showing that uh, the uh, lamb survival, uh, lamb loss figure over time has jumped around a lot with seasons, obviously, but uh, has stayed roughly at a long-term average of about 15% uh, over that time. So what, what I'm going to talk about is to try to describe uh, and just summarise um, basically how lamb survival could be improved and reproduction. Firstly, just, just summarise a little bit of uh, management interventions uh, and gains that can be made within say about the first six months of, of the uh, six months after the intervention has gone. And then I'll get on to breeding and uh, in a few minutes.
So if we just concentrate on uh, management issues, um, basically there's been a big focus in places like Australia and New Zealand really in the last 10 or so years on uh, you know, extending and doing research in better management to try to improve lamb survival. And we've had lots of workshops and so on. Um, clearly the gains can be reasonably quick. I guess the issue is that uh, you know you have to continually put the inputs in. So I guess when we talk about um, breeding, we're really talking about a situation where we can get make more permanent gains. I'm having a little bit of trouble here because the uh, icon that uh, um, Chloe for the webinar is covering some of my slides. So I might just um, persevere with that. Um, but basically with management, what I'm showing here is a fairly simple table where uh, on 13 Australian farms uh, in mainly in Southern Australia, uh, U condition was, was examined uh, with condition score at lambing. So a lambing uh, condition of 2.3, which is not obviously recommended, but for comparison, uh, these animals were compared with animals that had a condition score, roughly uh, one condition score higher at lambing time. And these were single bearing animals. These were twin bearing animals. You can see here on the far right hand side that uh, there was about a six percentage point gain uh, in lamb survival to weaning. Uh, when the condition score of single bearing ewes was one condition score higher. But in twin bearing ewes, the lift was 14 percentage points, which is really quite massive. So uh, just summarising there on that dot point. Uh, but even, even when ewes are in this optimal ewe nutrition around 3 or 3.2, survival in twins, these are merino, this is merino data by the way, uh, in Australia is still only about 71%, uh, whereas single survival is about 90% or greater. So, you know, there's still clearly some opportunities to improve survival in twins and of course in multiples. Uh, we've had recently had some work done on board Leicester Merino use, which has been the mainstay of the prime lamb industry in Australia for many years but also in maternal composite breeds, which are fast becoming more popular as well. Uh, and the results are, are similar. Uh, probably the optimal point for condition score with some of these animals is just a little bit higher, maybe up to 3.5 uh, condition score. So then if we move on then to breeding, so which rams to use or just genetic gain, uh, which is clearly a longer term gain. I want to show you some uh, genetic trends, which are basically just the genetic improvement being achieved in New Zealand with the Sheep Improvement Limited uh, Scheme. Uh, the graph I'm showing you is the total of basically uh, breeding values for lamb survival, both from the point of view of the lamb, uh, in other words, the direct lamb vigour component but also the maternal component of lamb survival, so the ewes contribution. Uh, and over a period since about 1999, 2000, when the scheme started, uh, there's been an increase of just under three uh, lambs surviving to weaning per 100 lambs born over that time, uh, basically under index selection. So in other words, uh, lambs, uh, sorry, ewes and the sheep were being bred for a number of traits, traits simultaneously, uh, of which lamb survival was just one. Uh, the next slide shows basically that the trend, the genetic gain for number of lambs born, which is really uh, a, a combination of pregnancy rate or fertility and litter size. And you can see here, since from about 1999 to uh, just last year, there's been an increase of something like 13 
extra lambs born, 100 ewes mated in over 200 dual purpose flocks in New Zealand. Now that really is a rather large gain, uh, especially when you um, consider that uh, you know selection's been going on not just for this trait and survival, but also a number of other traits. Um, the genetic gains in lamb survival are clearly smaller than this amount here. They're probably about one third. But, or, but if you consider that when you normally increase litter size and you get more twins and multiples, what you would normally expect is for survival to go down. So we're really pushing against that natural tendency for lower survival in uh, bigger litters. And so if you look at this gain and the gain in survival, <clears throat> clearly we we're actually weaning a lot more lambs. Firstly, where the number of lambs being born, but the percentage or the rate at which they're actually surviving to weaning. So even though those figures of three, for three lambs extra weaned, 100 born appears to be modest over a period of about 20 years, and when you can put it together with the litter size impact, it's really quite a it's quite a substantial gain and a credit, I think, to the breeders in New Zealand. So, but can we do better? Uh, and I've quoted here a, a past president of the United States. Yes, we can. Um, genetic variation in survival in twin born and multiple born lambs is much higher than for singles. So, you know, clearly we make genetic gain by working on the amount of genetic variation we've got. So if there's more, we can clearly make more gain. Now I'm showing a graphic here where this is the direct genetic effect. In other words, lamb vigor. If this, if this is the size of the variation in single lambs, uh, then compared to that, for both twin born lambs and multiple born lambs, we're getting just under three times the amount of variation there. But the interesting thing too, is when we look at maternal variation, in other words, the, the ewe component, uh, milking, uh, but, but also uh, you know mothering ability, uh, when we look at straight out the amount of maternal variation, and unfortunately we haven't been able to divide that into genetic effects and permanent environmental effects. So we look at the, the total of those two. The amount of variation in twin born is lambs is something like a bit over six times the amount of variation for singles and about 10 times the amount of variation when we look at multiple born animals. So in other words, mainly triplets compared to singles. Now that's, that's a phenomenal extra amount of variation that we can work on. And if we define our traits better, so we might be looking at a breeding value for say for twin or multiple bearing ewes, um, we can actually make more genetic gain. So that, that's a bit of a free kick really. Um, I don't know whether you use that expression in, in the UK on in soccer, but uh, in certainly Australian rules football, uh, that's been known as giving one a free kick uh, against the opposition. So, So also, and that's just a summary of what I've just said, but also it's interesting in, if you look at the survival rates in singles, twins and triplets around the world and in the UK, the best figures I could, uh, typical figures I could find in the UK are about those levels there. So singles is range from a, the lowest I could find is about 85% up to about 90%. Uh, is sort of a typical range. Twins about about five percent lower, maybe eighty four to eighty eight percent, maybe not quite as low as that. Uh, and triplets down around seventy to seventy eight percent. Thing is, with singles, when we're truly really trying to improve the uh, the genetic gain for singles, we're up against it because we can only get a hundred percent survival. So the as we approach a hundred percent it's going to get harder and harder to get gains. So really the, the big potential is for improvement in survival of twins and particularly of triplets. So 
So just moving on then to say, well, okay, that's direct selection. Can we make extra gains by finding indirect uh, characters or traits that will indicate the genetic merit for lamb survival and use that in our selection process. Well, a few years ago, I was involved with many others in Australia in the Australian uh, um, Sheep Cooperative Research Centre, which is basically uh, someone has rather unkindly described the cooperative research centre as putting a big pot of money in the middle of the of the room and then watching all the researchers fighting over it. Uh, that's a bit of an unfair characterisation, but we, we did get some very good collaboration in this project. And basically we researched uh, amongst a lot of other things, what were some likely indicators of survival uh, in sheep or lamb survival that is. So the ones we looked at included uh, lamb rectal temperature and I'll show some photos in a minute, some time lamb behaviours and I'll certainly describe the definition of these. So things like how long does it take for the lamb to bleat, to stand, to seek the udder, contact the ewe and follow the ewe. Lamb vigour, which is simply a score of how much, how much, uh, how vigorous it is in terms of struggling and so on. Uh, lambing ease, which you're more familiar with in the UK. Uh, uh, it's called, I think it's called lambing difficulty, I think in in Ireland, I'm not sure, or birth assistance. Uh, and finally then maternal behaviour score, uh, and I'll define these, and agitation or sheep temperament testing and flight speed. In addition to that list, we also looked at the fairly obvious things like birth weight. Uh, we also looked at uh, lamb birth coat, because there'd been some work done years ago that that might be related to lamb survival. But also we looked at measurements of the lamb. So things like the distance from the rump to the crown of the head, uh, the distance around the chest cavity or thorax, and the length of the metacarpal, which is the length of the, uh, the, the bone of the front of the animal. Uh, but none of those things I've just mentioned were all that useful. So I'll concentrate on the ones that are. Um, but just to show you before I move off that topic, uh, and sorry, Sam, I'm gonna show some genetic correlations here. So bear with me, it's about the only way I could think to do this. If we look at birth weight, uh, and we split that up into birth weight of singles, twins, and multiple lambs, the genetic correlation, which is the one that's in red here, which is the probably the most important thing from a breeding point of view, are very close to zero. Uh, in fact, for singles, they're slightly neg negative, which tends to say that if you breed for a larger birth weight, you will tend to decrease slightly the lamb survival. Whereas with twins and triplet, uh, uh, twins and multiples, uh, slightly larger birth weights are worthwhile. But all these things are very close to zero. And the conclusion I make from this is that it really isn't going to pay you very, very well at all in lamb survival by trying to genetically alter birth weight. So just, just back on to the list then I put up before, rectal temperature, what, what is it? It's basically a, in fact, when we did this work from 2007 to 2011, we used these little 20 Australian dollar VIX speed read thermometers, which you can buy at the chemist or, you know, boots or somewhere like that. Uh, I'm sure we can get some much more sophisticated ones now. Um, so in our situation, because we are extensively lambing, we did um, we did um, lambing rounds about twice a day. So usually starting about eight o'clock in the morning and then again at about 2, 2.30 in the afternoon. The problem is, of course, lambs don't necessarily all get born just as we're doing a lambing round. They get born during the night and so on. So it's quite possible that a lamb can be born uh, and measured when we come to it in the paddock, it could be up to 16 hours since it was born, in th theoretically anyway. So what we did is to try to take out some of the uh, influence of the age of the lamb at that point when we measured it, we actually tried to estimate the lamb age. And basically how we did that is we looked at 
things like whether the lamb had walked. In other words, was the membrane on the on the on the feet of the animal broken? Uh, was it wet? Had it been cleaned? Uh, and so, if if it hadn't been cleaned and it was still fairly dopey, you'd assume it was fairly newborn. If if it had been cleaned, uh, but what was still on the birth site was perhaps one to four hours. And if it was above four hours, it was probably very hard to catch and would um, follow the ewe quite quite closely. Uh, now, that's not 100% accurate. Uh, clearly, there's some possible issues with that. Say, for instance, if a lamb is not is almost deserted, then you might not expect the coat to have been cleaned very well. Uh, so there are a few little gremlins like that that can inter interfere with the accuracy. Um, just moving on then, these time lamb behaviours. So, so basically what we did is when we were tagging the lamb and doing the weights and recording birth coat score and so on, once the lamb was set down and released by the shepherd, we would actually measure with a time, uh, with a stopwatch, how long it would take for the lamb to start bleating after it had been released. And then how long it would take to stand on its feet uh, make contact with you, and this is really usually in chronological order of how these behaviours occurred. How long it would then take to locate the udder, and then finally, how long it would take to actually follow the you. And you can see here, I've just put stars against the ones that were the better indicators. So, so basically, follow the you was a really, really good indicator. Bleating wasn't too bad. The others were pretty ordinary. And, and locate the udder was not very good at all. Uh, so just moving on then. Um, so the lamb vigor score that we did. So basically, uh, this is while the shepherd was still holding the lamb. So the score of zero is when the lamb is still wet, newborn. Uh, we don't actually count that because you know it's unfair to do a vigor score when the lamb has just been born. Um, and we'd come back and do that again. At a later later time, so one would be a constant struggle that it bleeds in response to the to the ewe, non release reaches the ewe quite quickly, and then down to a situation here where uh, the lamb moves very little when it's held and lies on release. Now we're a bit concerned that maybe in some situations uh, lambs can have what we call a predator response. They think it's you know a bit bag, bit bag bad fox or, or something being around and they'll play dead. Uh, but anyway, that's probably needs a bit more research on that. It'd be a good, uh, good student project at some stage. But despite all that, we still got quite good relationships with lamb survival, which I'll show you in a moment. So maternal behaviour score, you may have heard about this. Uh, it certainly was first, uh, first recorded in New Zealand in the mid 80s. But basically a score of one is when the ewe stays close to the lambs while tagging occurs. And I've even heard stories where a ewe will lick the ear of the recorder. Uh, and a score two is where the lamb, uh, the ewe stays, is, is the ewe there, stays close to within 10 metres of where the recording is occurring. Uh, and then Progressively, when we talk about scores three to five, use of moving further away from the lambs during the tagging process, and the score five use that they actually don't return uh, after the lamb has been released. Uh, they're not particularly good mums. So um, I'll talk a little bit about these two because there's been so much money spent on agitation box scoring. So back in the, back about 15 odd years ago, uh, there was a report, uh, a lot of excitement about this agitation box scoring. So basically, uh, it was a closed in box. The animal would go in there two to six weeks after weaning and for about 30 seconds it would be recorded for the amount of shaking and, and agitation it would have. Uh, and, you know, there's quite early promise that this was related to lamb survival. Uh, but but unfortunately, like all things, uh, when more work was done with bigger numbers of animals, you know, some of the papers, uh, that early promise really evaporated. 
uh, similar with flight speed, uh, which is basically the, the speed that a sheep travels between two beams of light after exiting either a way crater or this isolation box. Uh, unfortunately, not genetically related to lamb survival at all. So yeah, we won't be doing any more work on that. So just in summary, uh, rectal temperature, very strongly related to lamb survival to weaning time. In fact, also on the day of birth and to day three. Internal behavior, lambing ease and lamb vigor scores, some useful indicators and they're easy to score uh, and they are related to survival. Uh, time lamb behaviors, lamb bleeding and especially lambs following behavior is also related genetically to lamb survival but they're time consuming to record. So I'm gonna move now into some results. Basically what I've done here, and um, just bear with me, I'll try to go through this reasonably slowly, is we've said, okay, we've, we've got a selection index where we've included lamb survival as one of the traits, and there are other traits involved, but we'll just focus on lamb survival for the moment. If we select on this index for 10 years, we get about just over one extra lamb born per hundred, uh, one extra lamb weaned per hundred years born. So that's our base. If we add to this index, just one measure at uh, taking time of rectal temperature, we increase the rate of ga uh, genetic gain by about 68%, okay? Likewise, if we add the following behavior just on its own, we get about 61%. If we add this observed score of vigor, lamb vigor, we get about a 40% improvement. Uh, maternal behavior score on its own, about 37%. Bleat, about 30%. And I can't see the last one, but I believe it's um, lambing ease which is, uh, comes in at uh, whatever it is. Sorry, my spectacles aren't good enough to read my paper version. Uh, about 16%, I think. Okay, so what do we, what happens if we add these animals, uh, add these indicator traits in combinations and so what we've done here is, so these are your base again, just a bit over one extra lamb to wean per 100, you, uh, 100 born after 10 years of selection. If we add to that base rectal temperature and following behavior, we basically get an increase of about 150 odd percent. So we take the gain from about just over one to close to three extra lambs wean per 100 years born after 10 years of selection. If we add to that combination, also vigor score, we get another uh, roughly uh, another 19 percentage points. Uh, add maternal behavior score, we don't really get much extra gain. In fact, we're about the same. Same with bleating. Finally, if we add lambing ease, we get about another 25%. Uh, now what I've done in this next graph is said, well, let's be a bit more practical about this. Let's remove the time lamb behaviors because they are really quite uh, awkward to measure in a commercial situation. So if we just look at a combination of adding rec uh, rectal temperature and lamb vigor, we get almost a hundred percent increase in gain over and above the base. Uh, we get a little bit more if we add maternal behavior score and a little bit more again and when we add um, lambing ease. Okay, so I might just explain a little bit about um, those time lamb behaviors and why I, th I think they are not practical. When we did them in research, we had two people doing recording and one had a stopwatch and the other was doing the uh, doing the spotting um, and what observing the behavior. But if you had 
twins or triplets, uh, you can imagine the, the time I had to record, uh, you know, two to three lambs simultaneously and the recorder had to yell out. So there's a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. So that's why I think it's a bit impractical. And apart from the, obviously the labor cost. Um, just, if I can just pull all this together and just try to summarize. So contribution firstly to genetic gain for lamb survival, I've we'll ranked them in order here. So we've got rectal temperature followed by following behavior uh, down to lambing ease. So all of those are good indicators, but particularly rectal temperature and following behavior and to some extent, vigor score. In terms of easy, ease of use, I've tried to rank them as well. So rectal temperature, obviously putting a thermometer in uh, the rear end of a lamb is invasive, but there's been some interest in looking at thermal cameras and they have some potential. So we may be able to do better than having an invasive measure, but certainly a $20 thermometer is uh, fairly low cost. Um, following behavior, it's a good indicator, but it's not practical. I, I certainly wouldn't suggest putting the effort in there. Uh, I think vigor score is certainly worth trialing. And I believe Daniel, uh, Sa Samuel has, Sam has some uh, data already from, uh, from breeders who have submitted uh, data on that. Uh, uh, maternal behavior score, score, it's certainly under trial in Australia and um, there's some interest elsewhere as well. Um, lamb bleating behavior, similar to following and not as good a indicator anyway, so I wouldn't suggest that. And lambing ease, it's certainly easy to record and you get some gains, but the other thing is it makes lambing easier and and possibly has some benefits from, or probably does have some benefits from improving uh, uh, ewe survival. So just m moving on from there, what if we go to the extent of adding um, genomics to the, to the estimation of breeding values for survival? Uh, in a number of countries that's already starting to happen uh, in New Zealand and Ireland uh, and Australia, but certainly in New Zealand, they added this so-called single step procedure where they evaluate the genomics and the traditional pedigree information and uh, phenotypic information all at the same time. They did that starting in uh, late 2018. And I'll show you some um, information in a moment about uh, what the result of that has been. Uh, in Australia and Ireland, they're still trialing those procedures. Uh, we have some, particularly for maternal breeds in Australia, they're actually being trialed and we produce what we call uh, research breeding values. Uh, they'll eventually become uh, normal breeding values once the numbers have been built up. Uh, just in terms of well, how much extra accuracy are we getting from adding genomic information or genetic, genetic testing? Uh, well, in, in New Zealand, it seems to be about 20%, uh, but there's some caveats on all that and it certainly needs confirmation, but that's about roughly what I worked out from the before and after or effect of adding genomics to their breeding value estimations. Okay, Sam asked me specifically to talk about the impact of changing lamb carcass traits on new performance. Uh, it was a question that had, had, is current, uh, currently um, being queried in uh, the UK apparently. And certainly in Australia, there's been a big interest in the last, I would say the last five or six or seven years on uh, can we use scanned fat depth and muscle our muscle depth, which is scanned usually at the sort of basically the young ages to get um, better maternal performance. In other words, select for those and try to get a correlated improvement in maternal performance. Uh, look, I've tried to summarize the answer and the short answer is there is a connection with those traits, but it's not strong. Uh, and we're certainly much better selecting directly for improved reproductive performance. Uh, 
then we are uh, putting a lot of selection emphasis on um, fat depth and eye muscle depth. Um, the yeah, I, again, I can't see this figure here, but it's rearing ability is what I'm looking for. Uh, also, selection, and this is going back to work done in Scotland, I believe, uh, um, about 20 years ago. Also, selection for carcass leanness and Scottish blackface use uh, was not detrimental to maternal performance. And just picking up some of the indicators in the papers that they were written at the time, uh, the ewes that were selected groom their lambs more quickly and lambs actually um, were a little bit more vigorous. So in fact, it was really the opposite of what uh, what um, what was postulated at the time that if we got made the, made the Scottish blackface ewes leaner, we may actually lose some reproduction. Uh, having said all that, under uh, basically under fairly extreme conditions in Australia, uh, the question is if we can make the ewes a little bit genetically fatter, uh, are they more resilient in poor seasons? You know, if we run out of pasture and we've only got a limited amount of money to feed supplements, uh, is the point at which we need to start, start giving supplements in the season uh, later with uh, genetically fatter ewes? And the answer is, well, yes, it is. And a PhD student, uh, myself and colleagues had Sam Walkham uh, published a number of papers on that in the last few years. Uh, and we looked at things like merinos, but we also looked at border lester merinos. Uh, but certainly we couldn't see a big improvement in reproduction just by genetically making them fatter. The advantage seemed to be in requiring less supplements. In other words, a bit more resilience and not needing as much, much expensive supplementary, supplementary feeding. Uh, Sam also asked me to cover genetics of ewe behaviour and I thought the best research I could think of was research that's been done in South Africa by a colleague called Skalk Plerty and Skalk for about 20 years selected a group of merino sheep for what he called uh, multiple rearing ability. So just one trait and over that period uh, they improved lamb survival by about 10% 10% over that 20 years. But the interesting thing was, if we looked at the other things that changed in that flock that was selected, the lambs uh, certainly stood more quickly after birth. They sought the udder more quickly and the ewes cooperated more in allowing suckling activity to go on. The, flat, the lambs followed the ewe more and the ewes groomed the lambs more quickly and interacted more with their lambs than unselected uh, ewes. Having said that, uh, um, Skull uh, Clothy certainly recommends that he feels that direct selection for rearing ability or lamb survival is really the priority. And that's the first thing you do. And then consider the case for indirect selection based on evidence as an add-on, okay. So just to summarise so far, uh, achieving genetic gain in lamb survival is certainly challenging, but incremental gains can be made. And that certainly would complement improvements in management, nutrition and shelter and so on. And several countries have now have lamb survival in their national genetic evaluation schemes. Uh, and just going to the New Zealand results there, gains of approximately just under three lamb, extra lambs weaned per 100 years born, been gained over a period of 20 years. At the same time as there's been another 13 lambs uh, being born per 100, uh, per 100 ewes mated uh, in New Zealand under index selection, so selecting for other things as well. Um, we have potential ways, and also there's, there's some results now coming through an island. I haven't listed that, but uh, the gains since 2009 are certainly coming through now. So potential ways of boost, boosting genetic gain in lamb survival include a better description uh, of lamb survival. So can we describe it better by looking at within birth, birth types? And we believe we can. 
and then doing the complementary analysis to, to get the benefit of that description and make more genetic gain. We believe that of all the indicator traits we looked at, some of them can actually lift accuracy and therefore selection uh, uh, genetic gain. And we can also make perhaps about 20% extra gain from use of genomics. And then just finally to finish off on this bit, uh, we believe that uh, scanning or use scan information on fat depth and eye muscle depth, depth they're really only weak indicators of reproduction but they might help boost resilience in poor seasons under extensive grazing conditions. And I guess, you know, you'd have to decide whether uh, in your situation, whether uh, that is applicable to you or whether uh, it's not applicable. Uh, so just finally then, I'd like to talk about uh, selection within the current generation. In other words, the current flock that you've got, can we make some improvements and get uh, medium-term gains within one to four years. Certainly some evidence uh, that we think you can do that comes from work done in Australia on uh, firstly culling dry ewes, which, which I'm sure is not a new phenomenon, but also, and perhaps what is a bit more new, is keeping productive ewes longer. And this really comes from work that was done by colleagues of mine in New South Wales uh, a number of years ago. In fact, uh, Kevin Atkins and Greg Lee and a few others, uh, where they looked at one of their highly pedigreed merino flocks there and they said, okay, let's divide it up into four, into quartiles. Let's look at the performance of this, uh, these animals on based on their lifetime reproduction rate. Uh, let's look at the bottom 25% for ewe fertility, litter size, lamb survival and the number of lambs weaned per you joined, which is overall um, pr productivity per, per year. You can see here the bottom 25%, only 55% of them were pregnant. There was about a 20% uh, uh, twinning rate, so 1.2 lambs per, per, uh, per lamb lambing, uh, per ewe lambing. Of the lambs born, only 47% of them were making it through to weaning time, which is disastrous. And there was only 30% lambs weaned per ewe joined, or 0.3. In contrast, we look at the top 25% of the, of the flock on lifetime reproduction. 95% of them were pregnant. We were getting 60% twins in merinos, uh, or 1.6 lambs per ewe lambing, uh, for lambs per ewe lambing. They were surviving at the rate of 90%, so a lot of those were twins, remember. And we we're weaning 140% uh, or 1.4 lambs per ewe joined. So a number of us uh, have done some further work on this. And uh, again, in New South Wales, in South Australia and uh, is CSIRO, which is also in New South Wales, where we looked at um, um, the same thing in a number of different flocks and said, well, okay, how, how much gain can we make by doing practicing uh, some strategies on culling and keeping lambs longer? So really uh, this graphic just shows a more flexible flock structure. So we've got um, animals uh, two or three years years of age being removed because they don't perform. So here's lamb there, uh, you there. And then we remove and keep the ewes that are performing better longer. So instead of perhaps selling the animals at say five years of age or five and a half years of age, we keep them either one or two years longer and then sell them. So we had three different flocks here. This is CSRO at Armidale in New South Wales which is basically a fine wool flock, Trangy uh, in middle New South Wales and Sardi in South Australia, a flock I was involved with. Uh, basically, just to go to the, the bottom line, if we looked at the overall reproductive efficiency, if we practice both culling to use twice and keeping the better performers longer, we could make an extra nine lambs wean per hundred years joined in, that, in the remaining flock wasn't so much in a trangy at about four 
extra four lambs when you joined in the Saudi flock in South Australia. Now the components of that, a lot of it was coming from just culling dry ewes. And I might stress culling on two records, not just one. Uh, and a little bit from rearing extra singles and extra twins. So just, just on culling, and I know this is of interest because most breeders in, in, uh, in Australia also um, probably think they can cull basically just on one record. Well, in the Saudi flock, we decided to try that. And so we culled, at least on paper, uh, just on one record where a ewe was dry. You can see here we've got a gain, a lift of just under or 1.7 extra lambs wean per 100 ewes joined. You might say that's a good good result, but we had to throw out almost 30% of the flock. If we decided to keep our powder dry and cull when the ewe had had a second uh, dry a dry incident from uh, an opportunity to lamb, we still got. 1.2 extra lambs when per 100 years joined, but we only threw out about 7%. So we get a little bit extra when we cull on one, but we have to throw out a lot more animals, about four times the amount of animals. The problem with that is if we're wanting to maintain new numbers, we've got to bring in a lot of more maiden ewes. And we know maiden ewes have a lower, when, when I say maiden, I mean a, a ewe that hasn't been joined before. We know they have a lower weaning percentage. So that actually reduces the gain in the overall flock weaning percentage. So yeah, don't cull on one event would be my advice. So just in summary, uh, uh, and we we call this project that we worked on culling passengers and retaining performance. So the main benefit from decreasing in proportion of dry ewes, increased proportion of ewes that successfully wear, uh, wean lambs, more efficient to select old ewes to be retained based on their lifetime winning percentage. Uh, but don't cull and make decisions based on a single reproductive record. Now just finishing finally, I mean this was done in merinos, but there's certainly evidence that as you as the as the um, as the litter size goes up in the breeds that you're more working with in the UK, it's likely that this this result may in fact be better than what I was showing you. So it'd be certainly worth doing some studies uh, in the UK on this because it gives you a reasonably, I won't say quick, but uh, certainly a benefit um, in say over a period of one to four years in extra lambs weaned. That's about all I've got, uh, Sam and Chloe and, and the audience. Um, so happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Forbes. So um, while I'm waiting for a few questions to come up, I'd just like to remind you that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available to watch on the YouTube channels and you'll also receive an email with the link to that. Um, so Forbes, we do have a few questions already. So the yes. first one, are Australian and UK body condition scores the same? So are they comparable against each other? Uh... I hope so. I, 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 yeah, you've caught me off guard because I'm, I'm just not sure. A condition score one in Australia would be considered an emaciated animal, yeah. and condition score three would be considered an animal in good condition. Four is certainly very generously covered over the short ribs, and five is virtually bordering on obese. So, and, and for the body. Body size of it, say a typical sheep in Australia might be say 55 to 60 kilograms of mature size at condition score three. A condition score, one condition score is equal to somewhere around seven to eight kilograms of body weight. So I don't know whether I've answered the question because I don't really know the British uh, condition that scoring system. Sounds very well. similar. Yeah, that yeah. sounds very similar to, to the UK with a, a yeah. one to five score. Yeah, I mean your your body your overall body weights might be slightly higher, although uh, some of the merinos in Australia are getting very large now. There's some concern we're getting our sheep too big. 
that's a presentation for another day, but that <laughs> it would be very similar from a UK perspective as well. Lots of discussion about um, optimum U mature size, and there's actually a nice abacus bio report that people can look at online where um, yeah. we've looked at that from a UK perspective. Yeah, I'll just add there that unfortunately, in under the Sheep Cooperative Research Centre, there was a PhD student who who looked at the link between body size in use and efficiency. Although he finished his studies, he never published anything out of that <laughs> thesis. <laughs> this is a great shame. Thanks both. Um, the next question is, is lamb survival calculated from scanning or birth or tagging? Are there consistent academic definitions of lamb survival? Yes, that's a good question. At the moment, uh, in Australia, it's been calculated on uh, lambs born, but we're moving in the genetic evaluation, which is controlled by sheep genetics, to a situation where, like they do in New Zealand, if uh, people have scanning records and maybe they don't have lamb, do lambing rounds, we can move to a, a, uh, a figure on uh, lamb scanned. And I think that's an advantage to us in Australia because we tend to get uh, carcasses removed from paddocks by foxes. So we're never quite sure whether our lambs born figure is totally accurate. And from a UK perspective, Chloe, we're looking at a number of lambs that are born and then we deduce survival on the basis of whether animals go on and get weighed at any point later in life or to go on and become parents. So it's, it, we can do it without collecting any additional data. Having said that, in the Welsh Hill Sheep Breeding Project, we're going to get a lot of pregnancy scanning data coming through that we can store. So we've certainly got a database where we could look at that alongside. You'd hope they'd be fairly closely correlated. Yeah, I think, that, I mean, there is some concern that, you know, you do get some, you know, late, late fetal loss. There's actually a project going on in Australia at the moment on just on how big that loss is. Uh, in some of the earlier work done here in South Australia, uh, you know, the losses weren't very large at all. So we found a very good relationship between uh, lambs scanned and lambs born when when uh, it was studied in, um, you know, with twice daily lambing rounds. When I say con good relationship, the lambs born figure was always lower because of this predator. We think of predators taking carcasses from the paddock that we never found, even with twice daily lambing rounds. Thanks, Forbes. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, the next question is what are the parameters for rectal temperature, please? Uh, the, do you mean the heritabilities? Um, and the correlations? I think I think so. It's just what are the parameters for the rectal temperature? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, I can show them. <laughs> uh, I'll need to go back and um, unhide some slides. So just give me a second. Um, we didn't show them because I didn't want to show too much um, technical stuff. But if there's a question there, that's fine. Um, so just you'll you'll see a few funny things going on, on the screen. So Forbes, what should rectal temperature be in a lamb? Oh, I see. You know, like the absolute amount. I think it's a little yeah. bit higher than humans uh, and the adult sheep. I think it's about thirty-nine degrees is about the average. Uh, am I going to be able to show this? We can see the heritabilities there. Yeah, okay, so um, I'll just click the, yeah, so so basically lambing ease for us was quite lowly heritable, but rectal temperature is about 5%, which is just a little bit more than the, the overall lamb survival. Um, and then maternal behaviour score is quite high. If I go on, to, uh, no, I won't, I'll have to go back to, the next slide, if I just unhide that. 
Can you see now, now the correlations? Yep, we can. So I've tried to show them as histograms so that you can get an idea of the scale. This big one up here is rectal temperature. So this is one single measure of rectal temperature out in the field when the lamb is either newborn or up to 16 hours old. Uh, this is the relationship genetically with survival to weaning. The correlation with survival to the day of birth was even higher, it was up around 0.87. So it's clearly a very good indicator of, of survival. Follow also is quite highly, you know, almost strongly genetically related to survival to weaning. And you can see the drop off here with these others, which tends to, uh, we, we tended to show that in those predicted genetic gain figures from adding these extra, extra uh, components. So it's a combination of how heritable the trait is and how well correlated it is with, with survival itself. So does that Thanks. answer the question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've just got a couple more on that subject. So how does rectal temperature vary with age or activity? And what temperature should it be and what does good and bad look like? Yeah, well, um, we're talking about an average of about 39 degrees and, um, you know, a poor temperature would be anything below 32 degrees because the animal then is starting to go into hypothermia. You know, that, that's a lot of work done in Scotland by John Slee and uh, Alistair Stott and so on years ago on uh, water bath testing. Uh, so that a lot of that information comes from there. Uh, and, uh, you know, but lambs can be quite hot. You know, they can be up around 40, close to 40 degrees. Uh, we're only really talking about the period immediately after lambing here. We're not talking about what the lamb temperature might be a few days afterwards, I, I wouldn't really know. This is very much that early neo neonatal period that we're talking about. And the thing that really surprised me is we've had a very rough measurement out in the field with really cheap thermometers, and we're still getting a, you know, a, a really, really strong genetic correlation with lamb survival to weaning. So I, I think it's amazing that we got any correlation hardly at all. <laughs> So it's clearly related to something. <laughs> Thanks, Forbes. We've just got another question on that as well. The lambs that were perhaps either too high or too low in rectal temperature, did you do any interventions with those lambs? Uh, probably not, no. Um, oh, we, we definitely assisted ewes that were in trouble. Uh, but we didn't foster lambs or, um, you know, put lambs in, um, confine them in rings with you in the paddock, anything like that. There's, I mean, we're talking about um, over eight flocks around Australia, lambing down about 5,000 ewes. So uh, we just didn't have the labour to to do that extra bit. But some of the, some of the students were involved as well and uh, they did, you know, side experiments and so on. So there may well have been some uh, extra uh, care and attention given to those lambs in those trials, um, but no, generally not. Okay, thank you. Unf and unfor unfortunately, it was just the way yeah. it was. Um, and is a cold mouth by touch a good method of gauging lamb temperature? It would probably give you some idea. There's, there was some work done um, uh, on uh, just uh, just in the West Indies a few years ago on using thermal cameras, and one of the best indicators was temperature just close to the eye. That was that was a very stable place to record temperature. Correlation was very high with uh, rectal temperature, so maybe the mouth isn't so bad after all. But I think there's some real potential you know, in the thermal camera use. They're getting cheaper as time goes on. We use them a lot in Australia for uh, bushfires, knowing where hot spots are and so on. 
Thank you, Forbes. Um, and the relationship between genetically fatter use and survival, does it depend on which fat deposit has been selected for? So, for example, sub subcutaneous fat versus intramuscular fat versus internal abdominal fat? Yeah, I just don't think we have a good enough uh, amount of data to really give you a, a good answer to that. Um, I suspect that there is some differences between the different fat depots and the relationship, but there's also quite a lot of variation across when these things have been studied, the relationship varies in different flocks, which again suggests that the, the relationship is not that strong. Um, yeah, so to, to have a really good indicator, it needs to be uh, consistently strong across a range of flocks. And I, I don't have the answer either, um, but we should just remember that it's been quite nice work with the CT unit up at SIUC, where they scanned yes. hill use over a period of time, looking at fat depots and um, use survival. So yeah. there's is, there is some good research information there. It, it may or may not be tied back to some of the things that we're measuring in lambs, yeah. but that, that's quite one, handy. One of the challenges, I guess, for research and also industry is when you're looking at things like genetic relationships or genetic correlations, it's very it's very demanding of, of uh, having a lots and lots of data. So we need to be talking about at least maybe 200 to 400 sire families uh, and possibly uh, you know, up to say three or four or five thousand ewes. That that's the sort of size of data set you need to be working with to have any chance at all of getting a reliable estimate of genetic correlation, and preferably a lot higher than that too. I mean, some of these data sets I've been talking to you about, we had something like, you know, twenty-five thousand records. I think the the ones on uh, looking at birth type by lamb survival, we're talking about thirty-six thousand records at that stage. And you know some of the industry data sets are even bigger, like 100,000. Forbes, a couple of questions from me, if Chloe will allow it. Um, you've got us thinking quite interestingly about lamb survival within birth type. So thinking about lamb survival within the twins to make faster gain. Um, should we be thinking about lambing ease within birth type, I wonder? And secondly, lambing ease is, it seems to be a small part of the picture in Australia in terms of helping lamb survival, but is that because your phenotypic and genetic variation in lambing ease is relatively small? If you move to a country where we had a greater spread in lambing ease, do you think it would answer more of the lamb survival question or not? Okay, so there's sort of two questions there. I've forgotten the first, <laughs> first question. Um, the... George, well, so, Do you want to answer the, sec the second one then? Yeah, Do you I'll think the second, second one, yeah. Yeah, certainly, certainly uh, one of the big problems with lambing ease in, under extensive conditions is that we're only actually observing about 10% or less of the use. So, you know, the data set is actually quite small. Um, and so the amount of variation that we're looking at is tends to be skewed towards the lambs, uh, the ewes that are having trouble. We don't, and we don't physically observe the ones that uh, lambed unassisted. And the, the, the first so question was, the was do you, yep. if you have more variation in, in lambing ease, do you think there's any merit in it looking at it within birth type? In other words, the ease with which yep. singles or the ease with which twins are produced, because you've got different factors. One is, a, I would suggest, a birth size issue. The other can be more of about an entanglement and placement issue, certainly when you yeah. get up into triplets. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it would be sensible to certainly have a look within birth type, but you'd probably do it uh, in conjunction with also looking at birth weight, even though birth weight doesn't seem to have a big influence. I think to get a good understanding, you probably need to look at birth weight lambing ease and survival uh, as a sort of a three-way interaction. Yeah. Oh, Chloe, we've got a dim rumble. 
think it's my neighbours doing some drilling, so I'm sorry about that. I can't do <laughs> anything about it. That's, that's not homeschooling then. No. That's, um, that's not the bagpipes. God. <laughs> Right. So the next question is, from an animal health perspective, um, could giving empty animals a second chance be bad for managing flock health issues and iceberg diseases? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the failure to lamb or even to get pregnant is is necessarily just a health issue, you know, it, and I, I don't really know the answer is, I suppose, the short answer, but um, just speculating as to, uh, you know, what is causing that barrenness, if you like, it could well be uh, anatomical, it could be behavioural, uh, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a health related issue. So uh, I don't know, that'd be a good one to study. Yeah, I guess there is Sorry, a risk. Sorry, I can't. There, I, can't. I, I, I haven't got a definite answer to that one. Um, and on a similar similar subject, um, is a dry the, a dry ewe is that one you've classed as milking poorly or is it simply not produced a lamb? Yeah, sorry, the, the terminology is a problem here with uh, with blinking Australians. Uh, dry mm -hmm. usually. The, the term dry in Australia usually means a ewe that hasn't lambed and and it's nuanced because people are now doing a lot of scanning, pregnancy scanning, so they regard a ewe that doesn't uh, doesn't have any uh, any fetuses as dry. Um, but we also tend to distinguish um, ewes that have been pregnant at scanning time and fail to have a lamb as lambed and lost, or it might be a late a late uh, fetal loss. So yeah, the definition dry usually means the ewe hasn't lambed. Thank you. Barren, barren would be probably a more correct term. Yeah, thank you. Um, and you comment on, again, culling on just one event, um, cool ewes can be worth good money at the right time of year. So did you find, if you're keeping those used for then a couple of years longer, are they then worth quite a bit less by the time they're cooled? Uh, and, and we're talking, we're we talking about under UK conditions, I suppose, because under under Australian conditions, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference because the if you present uh, use in the marketplace um, that are one year older, you know when probably talking three years old versus two years old. Uh, I, I guarantee you would hardly notice any difference in the in the sale price and certainly not sold directly to the abattoirs. Um, but in the UK, that may not be the case. It might You might be more cognizant of the fact that they are actually dry use. Yeah, I guess I was thinking in terms dry. of body condition score so the ewes if they're kept for several years longer than, than normal they may be in quite a, a poorer body condition score by the time they're they're cooled if they're a bit older and I didn't know if that had made much difference. Uh, yeah I would think it might be quite the opposite because if they haven't actually had a lamb uh, on one occasion or even two occasions they may well be the fattest ewes in, in, the, in the flock. Okay, yeah. And, and unless, unless they have an animal health issue, you know, like there's something wrong with them. Um, but normally, normally, uh, you know, there's, there's quite quite a quite a myth in Australia, which a film was made about by researchers a few years ago. The myth was fat ewes don't get in lamb. But what people were observing is fat ewes at lambing time that didn't, didn't have a lamb. They were fat because they didn't get in lamb, not the other way around. Thank you. Um, and is the relationship? Is there a relationship? I'm oh, sorry. Somebody there. Is there a relationship between lamb survival and brown fat levels? Uh, yes, there definitely is. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of work done on that, including uh, one of one of students, I, I had uh, Kate Plush, or, uh, 
And um, I know there's a lot of work done. I can't remember his name now, but uh, Nottingham. Um, so brown fat isn't just deposited around the uh, the kidneys and and the uh, that area. It's also in the brisket and a few other spots like that. It's quite surprising, really, that where it where it is. So we probably don't know enough about brown fat and survival at this stage. And Forbes, um, we talk quite a bit over here every now and again about selection for twinning per se. So not having one, not having three, just having two would be perfect. Um, yeah. There's various areas where that's been studied and papers written. What, what's the current sort of thoughts in Australia on, on, on that challenge? Uh, probably fairly similar in the sense that we've gone away from, we're starting to go away from just selecting for a composite trait like number of lambs weaned. We're much more interested now in getting the right combination of litter size and fertility. Uh, so we've we're now got three traits rather than one. We've got conception rate, um, basically litter size and, and rearing ability. Uh, they are now being implemented in Australia, uh, at least in a research sense. Uh, but probably in another year or so, they'll be available just as normal breeding values. So it, it's tending to go that same way. We're, we're focusing on the fact that some use they might get a high breeding value for number of lambs weaned. They may have actually uh, produced three lambs and weaned one. Uh, and uh, that's not the sort of ewe we want. We want a ewe that uh, uh, yeah, bears two and, and rears two. But would you so think about you using non-linear non weightings on a trait like litter size. Yeah. We've started to develop that in high prolificity strains of Clin, where we actually have a non-linear weighting on the trait so that we don't yeah. over-reward the triplet and quad yeah. bearers. Yeah, I guess we haven't quite got so sophisticated in Australia because we simply haven't up till now had those component traits in our evaluations, yeah. genetic evaluation system. I contrast that with New Zealand where for a number of years now, they've had uh, a capped reproduction index, and they've, they're, there's the, the papers published over the last couple of years, including at our normal AAABG conference uh, on nonlinear economic values for survival, uh, uh, nonlinear economic values for uh, number of lambs born. So the same thing. So basically saying we're we're not going to um, give as much weighting to a ewe that has lots and lots of lambs, doesn't raise many. Yep. Thanks, both. Um, we have another question. The final slide seemed to suggest that there is some flock improvement in terms of lambs reared, but is there also some genetic gain to be achieved by only selecting replacements from ewes who do not have a rest year? Do not have a rest here. Uh, no, I'm, uh, tell me if I've misinterpreted the question, but certainly part of that current generation or current flock gain, a part of it will be a genetic improvement, and part of it will be this permanent uh, permanent improvement uh, that's not not actually uh, passed on to the next generation. In terms of ewes not having a rest year, so what are we actually meaning there? Are we talking about, say, if a ewe has, uh, is, is barren in one year, but then lambs again in the next year? I'm just trying to understand what yeah, the, the motivation behind the question. I presume that's what the question means, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly, certainly that selection of against uh, use that are twice dry or twice barren, shall I say, and then looking at the reproductive record over a couple of lambings and keeping the more productive use longer. Um, there's some work being done uh, by my colleagues on that, showing that where we select for that, we haven't uh, damaged the health of the ewes. 
they still they still produce equally well or better than ewes that haven't been selected. So for instance, their fleece weight is still good. They haven't declined. Uh, they, there's no, the death rate's no higher. Uh, their teeth don't wear more quickly. Just every other aspect that's been looked at. There's a paper by uh, Jess Richards and um, colleagues. Um, some of those people I mentioned before, Greg Lees and so on, uh, only published about a year or so ago. Thank you. And uh, we've got another question here. So there are many other factors affecting lamb survival. So one, for example, is vitamin E levels. Is this measured yeah. in any way? Uh, not, not in this particular set of data I've talked about, but there certainly ha has been and, and are studies going on in Australia on vitamin E or, and also its relationship with selenium. Uh, there's also um, there's also some work. There's a, I just saw a review published uh, on um, looking at things like calcium and magnesium levels as well. So yes, I years ago I got quite excited about iodine levels in, in on on producers' properties and did a did a study. And certainly areas some areas in Australia are a bit iodine deficient, and that's associated with poor vigour. Thank you. Um, and will genetic advances in growth rates give higher birth weights and hence problems with single birth weight lamb survival? Sorry, single birth lamb uh, survival. Yes, good question. That you have to be careful. Uh, yeah, generally the correlation, uh, there's a strength in the relationship between birth weight and uh, body weights at older ages but there's also enough independent variation that you can select for faster growth rate without necessarily increasing birth weight and uh, the terminal sire breeders in, in australia and new zealand uh, like the white suffix have been quite good at that you know they're getting really really good growth rates but they haven't they're keeping their birth weights in an, in an acceptable range by looking at you know looking and, and uh, taking account of breeding values. And from a UK perspective, you can now look at the trends in birth weights online. So you can have a look for your breed and for your yeah. flock. It's, it's a double edged sword. You're right. That's the challenge with sing, uh, singles. However, there might be a small increase in survival with twins if it goes up, but it certainly needs to be measured and monitored. Um, and that's something that we yes. can do. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 also where people are doing a lot of crossbreeding, um, you know, a, a, like a large birth weight sire line across a smaller uh, dam line could could end up with a problem because of incompatibility. Yeah. Thanks, both. Um, and from the research, how might you advise a commercial sheep producer breeding their own replacements? and advise them on a culling strategy to improve flock profitability and output in a practical way. Yes, yeah, so just, just to clarify, we're not necessarily talking there just about genetic improvement, are we? We're talking about the current flock, uh, current flock gains we were speaking about before. Uh, yes, breeding their own replacements. Uh, yes, well, yeah, if they're breeding their own, Breeding their own new replacements, I guess, not ram replacements. Uh, is that, yeah. Is that what that meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that the, the figures and the results I showed there were for merinos. I, I have a feeling that, as I said before, I think with breeds that you're uh, using in the UK with higher litter sizes, uh, we know that that the repeatability of survival in twins is a lot higher than repeatability of use. Uh, twin rearing is a lot higher than single rearing. So that would suggest to me there's actually quite a bit of scope in more fertile or more fecund flocks in uh, looking to see whether we can make those improvements in flock gain. So I'd certainly be uh, on the one hand uh, culling twice barren ewes and then if if the recording system will allow it, uh, keeping 
at least records on the first two uh, lambing events and then uh, taking a note of the ewes that were performing best reproductively and keeping the say the top 50% of those for a year or two longer. But one, one of the things we were wanting to do with the work, unfortunately we didn't get more funding, was to develop a bit of software for advisors and, and breeders directly to model their own flock situation. So you'd feed in your own uh, litter size, your your stocking rates and so on, and, and come up with a optimum set of strategies for improving flock gains. Uh, we didn't get that bit of work done, unfortunately. And I'll just do a shameless plug um, for a tool that we're developing over here, which is enabling the customization of breeding indexes in flocks. So particularly maternal yeah. flocks that might want to do something slightly different to the published indexes within the new Signet yeah. database, they can log on and have a bit of a fiddle and a play. We're, we're just bringing that online at the moment. It's yeah. not uh, released so, yet, but it'll be there this summer. So they're potentially phenotypic indexes as well, Sam, are they not just aimed at um, long-term genetic gain? The, well, those ones would actually be genetic, so it would be about changing the um, EBV weightings in the index and, and really yeah. having a look at what impact that would have. So that's something for the ram breeders that actually want to do something slightly different to the, the bog standard index. And it's yeah. also quite a useful teaching tool. Yeah. I mean, ideally, uh, with that current flock gain, in other words, just a phenotypic improvement from culling or just keeping the better use longer, we could develop, uh, you know, phenotypic indexes if if the performance recording was uh, information was there uh, that would optimise the performance of the current flock. That yeah yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know what your market for that would be, but it would certainly be something that would be potentially quite useful. Yeah. Thanks both. Giving um, more work there, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. You always have to finish off one of these things with more research is needed in this area. So you, you've crowbarred that in nicely. <laughs> Not so much research as just development. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple more questions. Um, so would culling on the first event help to help to select for propensity to breed? So especially if bringing in maidens. So although you lay, may lose money commercially, would it be better in the long term? Yeah, that that, that is a very good question, actually. <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, in other words, the ability to mate and get in get pregnant really quickly is that related to uh, what I was talking about before. The short answer is uh, I we haven't specifically looked at that, uh, but I suspect there is a bit of a connection. Uh, the problem is you come back to accuracy of identifying the poor performers based on just one record. Uh, if you had both the ability to get in lamb early, or you know, you know, the ability to to mate early and look at reproductive uh, perf performance just on one record. If you get essentially two traits, you might be able to improve the accuracy to a point where you could just cull on one event, but you'd need that early early mating information as well, maybe early puberty or something like that. And there are some, uh, some tests you can do um, on, um, whether, whether a ewe is approaching puberty or you can put T's or rams out or something, but it's, there's quite a bit of work involved. Yeah, I probably haven't answered the question all that well, but yeah, uh, again, uh, to quote Sam, probably more research needed there, but uh, I think there's there's some suggestion that there's, there's a relationship between the ability to get in lamb quickly and later reproductive performance. Thank you. Um... And your conclusion regarding giving an empty U a second chance, is that very dependent on the percentage of empties? So at a lower empty rate, could the conclusion be different? Uh, it's not particularly uh, subject to the proportion of uh, barren U's you find. Um, 
the a lot of this work was done in fully pedigreed flocks when single sire mating, so the pregnancy rate was lower. But the people in New South Wales have also looked at uh, syndicate mating flocks where they have teams of rams being used, and the and the pregnancy rate is usually of the order of eight to ten percent higher. And they found the same trends there as well. But it's uh, obviously the the higher the pregnancy rate, the less opportunity there is to cull non-pregnant ewes. So you know it's uh, but but the trend is the same. Twice, two records are better than one, and uh, by a long shot. Thank you. And what cost do you put on running a, bar a barren ewe for a year before she becomes productive again? Well, again, the economics in the UK are, are most likely different than Australia because, uh, unfortunately, the wool you grow tends to be not terribly uh, valuable. Whereas in Australia, at the moment, uh, a, U, a merino U, let's say at 18 uh, micrometres or microns, cutting five and a half to six kilos of wool is netting about 55 to 60 Australian dollars of wool value. So, um, and probably, a, um, so in other words, there's still income being generated by that ewe as long as she stays in the flock. So, but if she's not generating anything other than the lamb and she doesn't produce a lamb, then obviously the economics are a bit different. Yep, thank you. Yep. Um, and looking at the lamb survival um, progress that's been made in New Zealand, what measurements are they using to calculate lamb survival over there? Well, genetically, they're looking at the uh, genetic trend, which is the average breeding value from that particular drop of uh, animals. So if you were measuring what's what the sort of observed lamb survival is in the field, you would need to be looking at you know, a full reproductive study. Uh, so looking at um, you know, litter size uh, at scanning time, uh, and then uh, look at, look at the number of animals produced at the end, and then back calculate what the lamb survival was. I'm, I'm not aware that they do routine uh, studies like that um, on on every year. So what I was quoting was really a genetic trend, which is basically breeding values. Thank you. Um, and the final question from the listeners is, um, do you think that lamb presentation is affected by ram genetics? Lamb presentation, oh, as, as in whether it's a normal presentation or, a, or an abnormal one? So I, I think, think that's so, what there isn't any more detail, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but but certainly there is um, evidence of you know bad confirmation in rams or you know the genetics of the ram and lambing difficulty. Uh, whether I go to the extent of saying, well, you know, does does the ram genetics affect whether the you know the legs are back behind the head or or you know in some ways deformed? Uh, I probably really can't say, but, but certainly there's evidence that poor confirmation of the ram genetics doesn't do uh, lamb survival very much good at all. Uh, so certainly dystochia, uh, well, you know, lambing difficulty is certainly heritable. So, and, and, and uh, you know, that's a direct uh, effect of the ram genetics, not just the, not um, use probably also have an influence as well, but certainly the ram, rams certainly do or the RAM genetics at the level of, you know, big shoulders and those sorts of things. Thanks, Forbes. That's really interesting. And we've we've come to the end of the questions, questions from listeners. Sam, did you have any other comments? No, uh, not at, at my end. I could go on for another hour and I don't think anyone would thank me for that, as I think you threatened to mute us both at 11 o'clock and it's now 11.30. So mm. I would just like to say a personal thank you for Forbes for, for joining us for this and, and hand back to you, Chloe. Thanks, Sam. And yes, thanks, Forbes, for giving up your valuable 
valuable time and such thorough answers to everyone's questions. I think it's been much appreciated. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be on the YouTube channel and it will also be emailed to you and those that haven't been able to make it today. So thanks again and have enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. And hello, hello to all and thank you. I've enjoyed the experience. Super. Thank you, Forbes. Take care. Okay. Okay.